this this is uh, this is in fact a, a new venture for us. Uh, we're trying this out uh, a, a kind of uh, information session. Previous webinars have been much more uh, a, a panel of opinions and uh, kind of uh, much more discursive d discursive really form format. This is this is intended to be much more interactive. It's intended to be uh, to to address facts really rather than uh, tentatively finding a way through uh, a, 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 something which is horribly complicated. But not that I'm not saying that fishing isn't complicated. But by the time David is finished with you, uh, you will feel that it's much much less complicated than you perhaps start out. Uh, so. Um, we, we, depending on how this goes and depending on the feedback, you know, we would obviously welcome your feedback for, on, on this at, after, after the event. Uh, we, we may follow up with something similar on other subjects. Uh, so uh, Dave is going to run the rest of the show. I'll, I, I get to sit back and enjoy myself as, as much as you do uh, for the rest of this until I say cheerio at the end. Um, and sorry, I should have said at the start, um, I'm, my name is Bill Roger. Um, I'm Treasurer of European Movement in Scotland. And uh, David will introduce himself in a second. The, this is being recorded. Uh, if you haven't already noticed the little red light in the top left-hand corner of your screen, it's there to tell you it's recording. Uh, if you don't want to uh, have yourself recorded uh, or whatever, then you can always uh, make a comment through the chat box. Uh, I don't think that gets recorded in the recording as such, although obviously people can copy the chat. Uh, or if it, if you really object to being recorded, then this is the time to leave. Uh, I, I, I see everybody sticking around. So uh, the other thing is, if you could please uh, keep yourself on mute when you're not when you don't have something to say. And uh, just simply the number of people, otherwise the ambient noise will cause problems. So thank you very much for coming. And as, as I, I hope, I, I've seen a little bit of what David's going to say. I think it's really, really informative. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. David, over to you. Thank you, Bill. Um, uh, and uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, I shall attempt to... Um, share screens and do various other uh, technical whiz kid things, but uh, please forgive me uh, if uh, I happen to press the wrong button or am incapable of uh, uh, handling the technology. You may already see that I appear twice on the, uh, on the screen. Uh, that's simply because I've got another screen on the go so that uh, if anyone does happen to put up their hands, uh, I can try and keep an eye on uh, what is going on. Um, uh, a word or two about my um, background to start off with. Um, uh, I worked for many years uh, originally in the Scottish office uh, and subsequently in the Scottish government. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, I worked in fisheries uh, three times. Uh, I first worked in fisheries when I joined the Scottish office uh, in 1979, um, when we were attempting to divvy up the spoils between the different member states of the EU and the UK, Ireland and uh, uh, Denmark. Um, uh, leading to what was called the relative stability key. Um, there was a, a transition period for those of you who are sufficiently long in the tooth to remember uh, between 1972 when the uh, UK joined the EU and 1982 when it was integrated into the common fisheries policy. So there was quite a lot of toing and froing in the late 1970s uh, and early 1980s to set the framework for the UK's entry to the common fisheries policy. Um, I subsequently headed the uh, fisheries, uh, the sea fisheries division of the Scottish office uh, in the 1990s uh, and was heavily involved in 
the John Major uh, presidency of the European Union at that time uh, and uh, spent quite a lot of my time in Brussels uh, negotiating uh, a, a variety of fisheries issues. Um, and then finally, my last job before I took early retirement uh, was in the Scottish government, where I was the head of fisheries in Marine Scotland uh, until I retired. Um, the caveat that I should add is that I will try and um, uh, enlighten my colleagues as much as I can, but the and, and I'm reasonably familiar with what's been going on uh, both before and after Brexit uh, in the course of the last 10 years, but just bear in mind that I left the Scottish government 10 years ago, and so I don't have uh, up-to-date uh, in, inside knowledge. Um, so I'm now going to go and uh, attempt to share the screen with you, if I may. Uh, let us see, share screen. So can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, I've got thumbs up there. Um, the way I've, I've structured uh, uh, tonight's talk is that I will speak first about the catching sector of uh, the Scottish fishing industry. Uh, and then uh, I will go on to talk about processing and, and uh, fish farming, uh, with which I'm a bit less familiar. Um, but what I propose to do in order to break things up is to uh, stop uh, at the end of my slides on the catching sector uh, and have a Q&A session at that point, uh, and then go on to the second section of my talk on uh, processing and, uh, and aquaculture, and then have a further Q&A session uh, at, the, uh, at the end of that. So if you don't get to put your question on, uh on on the catching sector uh in 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 the middle of this uh, session uh, i'm sure you'll have an opportunity to do so at the uh, at the end um i should say that i have absolutely no objection if anyone wants to interrupt me uh not in order to make a comment but if there's anything that i've said that is uh, uh off beam or not understandable feel free to unmute yourself and shout out since I might not see your hand if it's up. But uh, if there are questions and answers and issues for debate, uh, I'd invite you to uh, uh, take a note of those and bring them up in one or other of the Q&A sessions. So um, final caveat, perhaps, some of this will be extremely elementary. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the fishing industry. Uh, I apologize uh, uh, for anything that, that looks as if it's, uh, if it's too, um, if, if it's too uh, elementary, uh, uh, but I thought it was important for those of you that may not have that degree of familiarity with the fishing industry, just to run through a few of the, of the basics. So, First of all, um, types of fish that we talk about. Um, first of all, um, we've got demersal fish. Um, these are fish that live close to the seabed uh, and they are generally known as whitefish. Um, and they're known as whitefish because most of them have white flesh, white, more or less flaky fesh, uh, flesh. Um, and the uh, species that fall into that category are uh, set out on the slide there. Cod haddock and whiting, which are the mainstays of uh, the Scottish fishing industry, saith in addition, and then monkfish and megrim, which fall into a slightly different category and are caught at different levels in the sea. But they're what we tend to refer to as whitefish, uh, and as I will come to later, the method of catching these different fish uh, depends on the type of fish that they are. So that's demersal. Second, 
pelagic. Now, pelagic fish are the fish that swim in shoals, um, and they fish. They they swim close to the surface or in mid water. Um, they are oily fish, not sort of pristine white fish, uh, and they are migratory. They follow their food sources around different areas of the sea in a very different way to the way in which the demersal species do. And the pelagic fish that fall into that category are mackerel, herring, uh, and sardine, for example, essentially oily fish. And they're referred to, as I say, as pelagic. Uh, for the Greek scholars among you, among you uh, that comes from pelagos. Um, and finally, uh, shellfish, that's crustaceans and mollusks. Um, and they cover a, a multitude of sins uh, and, and, and are caught in very different and, and um, uh, farmed as well in very different manners. First of all, you have nephrops, which are known in Scotland as prawns. Um, uh, they, al they also go by the name of Dublin Bay prawns or Norway lobsters. Um, but uh, as a general proposition, um, they're referred to as nephrops. Uh, uh, again, more Greek. Nephrops uh, comes from the word for kidney uh, in Greek, and it's um, it's because of their kidney eyes. I think that they're that they're known as nephrops. Nephrops norvegicus. Um, then there are uh, lobsters, which you'll be familiar with, and crabs. Um, which uh, run around the seabed, and bivalves, which you may have heard about recently, uh, and which we can talk about later when we come on to processing. Um, bivalves are the uh, shellfish that are not like... ...the uh, system whereby they filter out uh, their food from the um, uh, from the water and have uh, uh, two sides to their to their shells. Um, so in in that category, around the Scottish coast, you've got scallops, mussels, and cockles. Uh, and those um, Three broad categories are the ones that uh, our sea fisheries statistics tend to be divided into, demersal, pelagic, and shellfish. And this is just an illustration of the amount of fish of different descriptions that were landed in 2019 uh, by the Scottish fleet. Um, You'll see from that that as far as the value of those different fish are concerned, it's roughly one third, one third, one third, 190 odd million pounds worth uh, of, uh, of, of the three different categories. But the tonnage of fish from the right hand column you will see is very different. Um, the uh, pelagic fish in terms of price per ton uh, are worth a lot less uh, than uh, demersal fish uh, and uh, still less than shellfish, which are the most valuable uh, product by weight. Uh, and that, again, uh, we will see when we come on to it uh, in terms of the uh, way in which the fish are caught. So about one third demersal, one third pelagic, one third shellfish. Uh, and that's just a, a map that shows uh, the value of those landings divided again into pelagic, which are blue, demersal, which are yellow or orange, and shellfish, 
that are purple or pink, depending on how your screen is showing it. Um, the, uh, the majority of the value of uh, Scottish vessels fisheries come from the uh, Northern North Sea, Area 4A, uh, as it's known there, uh, which tends to be uh, the area between the, the northeast of Scotland and Norway. Uh, but there are similarly uh, fairly large uh, catches to the west of Scotland in area 6A. Um, the 6B figures there to the left are around Rockall, uh, and the 4B figures in the southern North Sea, uh, as you will see, are predominantly shellfish and demersal. Um, pelagic. There is there is herring uh, in the southern North Sea, but herring tend not to not to like that area too much. And anyway, all of our landings, sorry, all of our fish down that part of the North Sea tend to be shared with other uh, EU member states. So that's just a, a snapshot of where the value of landings by the Scottish fleet come from. Well, that's different. Uh, I should point out from where uh, uh, the, the, the fish are caught by all of the other UK vessels and other EU vessels and so on. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that there are different ways of uh, fishing uh, for these uh, species of fish. Demersal fish, cod, haddock, and whiting in particular, uh, are caught by trawlers. Um, the, that is to say, um, a boat or a pair of boats uh, drag a net uh, along the uh, seabed uh, and pick up whatever can't get through the meshes of the net. So depending on the size of the mesh in the net that they use, there are different fish that will or will not escape. And also there are a variety of other methods uh, designed to try and let fish that people don't want to catch escape uh, from the net as it trawled through. It doesn't actually sort of dredge the bottom, but it's pulled along near to the bottom of the, of the sea. The pelagic fish are caught uh, predominantly through something called a purse seine, which basically means that because they shoal and um, uh, swim near the surface, what the boats do is they surround the fish with a net and then pick it all up from the bottom. They tie it up at the bottom and, and uh, actually, they don't normally haul it out of the sea. Uh, what they do is they pump the fish from the sea with the seawater out of the net that they've drawn in. So they create a big sort of purse area that they then suck up the fish from. Whereas the tr in, in a trawl, you lift the trawl onto the boat and then uh, uh, allow the fish to, uh, to um, be deposited from the trawl, either onto the deck or into the, into the hopper on the, on the boat. Um, then we go on to shellfish. And again, the, uh, the method of fishing for different shellfish uh, is, uh, is very different. Nephrops, um, which are langoustine, um, you know, depending on where you fish them that length or if you're undersized around that length, langoustine are uh, generally fished by trawlers, um, but they are also caught uh, in uh, pots, creels. Um, but because they're quite small, they tend to be uh, caught by trawlers. They um, burrow into the sand uh, when they are threatened. So um, 
effectively what happens is that they trawl the, the seabed uh, wherever you have the, uh, the, a seabed that allows the nephrops to burrow into them. Um, lobsters and crabs uh, are caught around the Scottish coast uh, by creelers. Um, uh, people go around in small boats with pots that they put onto the seabed with boys um, with an appropriate bait in the pot and they wait for the lobsters or crabs, crabs to crawl into them and get trapped. So they're little traps that, or big traps for that matter, uh, that are put on the seabed and then uh, the fisherman goes round later, picks up the creel and takes out the lobster or crab um, for sale uh, and or redeposit in the sea if it's below the minimum landing size that is permitted. Um, now scallops um, uh, are either dredged or hand dived. Um, I don't know whether, whether any of you have been around the Scottish coast and seen uh, boats with lots of sort of chain mail um, down the sides, uh, but essentially a dredge is a rake um, with chain baskets uh, that collect scallops, uh, which needs to be um, raked up from where they sit in the uh, in on the seabed, that is a particularly controversial method of harvesting because it it basically um, uh, plows the seabed and kicks up the scallops into these these metal nets. Um, uh, there are those that argue that hand diving for scallops and picking them up by hand is a far more environmentally friendly method of fishing for scallops. But clearly um, the characteristics of that method of fishing uh, are, are very different from, uh, from dredging. And if anyone's got any questions on that, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Mussels tend to be farmed on ropes. So basically they're, it's a sort of fish farming activity uh, though they can be collected from uh, beaches, that tends not to happen too much. Um, they are, uh, they are, they stick to ropes uh, and they are grown in the sea, hanging from these ropes. You then take the rope in and remove the mussels for sale. And cockles, uh, which you find uh, in sandy beaches, are picked by hand. Uh, various people over the years have developed much more efficient processes of uh, harvesting cockles on the beaches, um, but they are all, um, well, they all tend to be very environmentally unfriendly and to destroy everything else that's on the beach, as well as killing the whole of the cockle population. So uh, cockle, cockling, tends to be something that people carry out by hand. Now, um, harvest controls. Um, this is about um, how we go, uh, or how people have gone, tried to go about uh, limiting the amount of fish that is taken from the sea. The point, the point of this is essentially to make sure that we don't create deserts in the sea and exterminate species of fish in different areas of the sea. Um, and so there are a variety of limits that are placed on the ability of fishermen to uh, spend time removing fish from the sea. Uh, and again, I'm happy to answer questions about these different harvest controls 
Um, but um, it is probably worth saying that uh, over the years, um, there has been quite a lot of tension between the hunter-gatherer instinct of the fisherman at sea who wants to chase uh, something that will he will be able to sell and the need for um, a policing system that ensures that uh, when these hunter-gatherers are out at sea uh, that uh, we do not destroy the stocks uh, that uh, are on, on which the the future of the industry is 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 dependent so you've got different forms of control um, classified into input controls and output controls input controls uh, are generally not used very much these days um, these are controls that limit uh, the power of the boat that uh, this is uh, related to trawling in particular the power of the boat to be able to haul its nets uh, through the sea and uh, collect fish in its nets related to that power uh, factor is vessel tonnage so that's the size of the boat itself and therefore how powerful the boat is. Uh, but over the years, um, the UK government, the Scottish government and uh, uh, other governments in different uh, uh, member states of the EU have operated uh, so-called decommissioning schemes uh, designed to remove engine power and vessel tonnage from the total fish killing capacity of the fleet. So we now have a, a smaller fleet in terms of the number of vessels. Uh, we may not have reduced the power and tonnage uh, as much as uh, people might have liked to do, but that, that's partly why the fleet is much smaller now than it used to be. Um, the third item there is time at sea, which is very unpopular with fishermen, um, which essentially uh, involved telling boats that they could only work part time. So something like, let us say, for the sake of argument, you can only put to sea for 10 days in every 30. And for the other 20 days of the month, you need to be laid up in port economically idle. It's a bit like furloughing, um, except that the fishermen were never paid to be in furlough. Um, they were uh, only restricted from spending uh, time at sea. Very unpopular, not least because um, it tends to encourage fishermen to kill as much fish as they can mm. in the short time that they can spend at sea. It's a bit like um, the old um, ring the bell at closing time in Scotland when the pubs closed at 10 o'clock see how much you can get in in your final in your final 10 minutes uh, before the uh, before the shutters come down so time at sea has been a particularly problematic area particularly as far as uh, the uk and scotland are concerned but it still operates for example um in uh in the us um where uh, off the uh, Atlantic coasts of the US, there are certain species uh, where they all go out to sea, a whistle is blown, and uh, people are allowed to fish for what turns into a number of hours, after which the final whistle is blown, 
uh, and no one can fish for that particular species of fish anymore because so much has been taken. Not a terribly economically efficient way of, of handling things. What we tend to focus on much more, but which also uh, uh, has problems, are the output controls. In other words, uh, not how much input you can put into the process of catching fish, but how much you are allowed to take out of the ocean. Now, the first way that you do that is by setting a total allowable catch. And you do that for everyone that fishes in a particular area for a particular species. So in the Northern North Sea, there is a total allowable catch for, let's say, cod. And the plan is to ensure that you don't exceed that total allowable catch. And in the days of the common fisheries policy, what would happen is if you got to the point of exhausting that total allowable catch as member states as a whole by say the beginning of November, you would then ban fishing entirely for the remainder of November and December until you could start again on the following year's total allowable catch from the 1st of January. Um, the total allowable catch is in line with uh, international practice set uh, at something that is known as maximum sustainable yield. That's the calculation by the scientists as to how much the fish stock can stand being harvested without uh, uh, um, leading to long-term decline. So the maximum sustainable harvest that you can take from the sea in the medium to long term. And that's how the scientists and ministers go about setting total allowable catches, or at least that's the theory. The scientists would say that they, uh, they offer advice uh, that uh, leads to the establishment of a total allowable catch, and that then ministers play fast and loose uh, uh, in finding uh, ways through the scientific advice. But again, we can come to that later uh, if anyone would like to discuss it. The total allowable catch is then divided into quotas between different, in the context of uh, the North Sea, different EU member states, the UK and Norway, uh, who, if, if they have managed to work together appropriately, will have agreed on the total allowable catch. And it's then subdivided into allocations between different countries and their vessels. Um, in the UK, uh, the quotas are then further subdivided uh, into allocations for each vessel. And the entitlements of each vessel uh, are allocated on the basis of their historic uh, uh, performance in terms of catching and on how much quota they may or may not have traded. So um, people can buy quota from other fishermen in a variety of different ways. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to complicate things further at this stage other than to say that there's a trading system in place that enables people to exchange quota entitlements uh, to allow them to catch more fish of the sort that they like or less fish of the sort that they don't like. Now, the problem is in the third bullet point there with discards. That is to say, if you are going out to fish for whiting, you will necessarily almost catch a certain amount of cod. 
and a certain amount of haddock um, because they all swim in together and whiting are smaller than haddock and cod. And if you set the mesh at a particular level and target whiting, uh, you will probably find that you will have cod and haddock in the catch. And if you don't have enough quota for cod, um, not that anyone, I, I mean, this is a hypothetical example because uh, people try and avoid this at all costs. If you found that you, let me do it the other way around. If you, if you were catching cod and you found that you didn't have enough uh, quota for whiting, what you would do is throw the whiting overboard so as not to be caught when you landed the fish. It wouldn't be counted uh, by the output controls that the government imposes. It would need to be calculated or at least estimated by the scientists because they're still dead fish and they've, they've still been caught and killed, but they have been discarded uh, and have not been brought to the place of landing and not been counted in the quota of that particular vessel. Now that's been a problem, uh, an intractable problem for years and has led to a variety of methods designed to try and ban discarding whilst not encouraging fishermen to fish for better quality fish of the same species. Because there's an economic incentive for a fisherman, or there used to be economic incentives for fishermen, to carry on fishing so as to select the best quality fish from what they caught and then dump overboard the lower quality fish for which they would get less money when they brought them to land. Relative stability you may have heard of, that's the, the method of uh, dividing catches amongst the member states of the EU. There's a key for each sea area and each species that gives you the entitlement, for example, of uh, um, Dutch fishermen in the Northern North Sea to X percent of cod or haddock or whiting, different, different quantities for, for each. It operates on output controls. As I've, as, as I've described earlier. Uh, and it provides for that division amongst the EU member states of, 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 of different quotas uh, of the species, but it doesn't uh, operate in relation to any shellfish other than nephrops, prawns. So the EU sets total allowable catches or agrees total allowable catches for prawns and those are then subdivided between the different member states. Uh, these are caught as you may recall by trawling. Um, the species that are not uh, caught by trawling tend not to be divvied up under the common fisheries policy not least because they're caught inshore. So that's crabs, lobsters, scallops, uh, cockles, mussels. There are no output controls uh, at international level on the, uh, on the harvesting of shellfish. Coming back to principally pelagic and uh, uh, demersal species, um, the problems that arise from this relative stability key is that it's based on uh, historic records of actual fish landings. In other words, the amount of fish that different fishermen have brought into port, not the amount of fish that they actually killed and not the amount of fish that they may have discarded. Um, so, for example, um, 
the UK traditionally has a rather small share of safe or coley as it's known. And the reason that it has a rather small share of safe is because no one in Scotland wanted to buy any safe. So what happened was that when the fishermen caught the safe, they dumped it overboard. So when you get to present economic circumstances where safe is actually quite valuable and a, a certainly a perfectly edible fish, there's, there's a similar situation with hake, um, you, you actually find that the fishermen, the fishermen's historic share is much, much lower than what they were actually catching. But it's very difficult to negotiate uh, a, a alternative mechanisms for dividing them up. That's one of the problems with the historic track record and with discards. Another of the problems uh, is also that um, you've probably all heard of fishermen's tales and how big the fish were or where they came from. There uh, historically has not been any incentive on the part of the fishermen to be honest about where a particular fish was caught. Partly um, because they don't necessarily want their competitors to go out and catch fish where um, they themselves were catching, but also because um, the relative stability key, for example, might say, if you catch this particular species in the North Sea, um, you're breaking the law. If you catch it west of Scotland, uh, that's fine. Um, and at one stage I can recall um, the introduction of special policing me measures between um, uh, the line that comes down between Orkney and Shetland, separating west of Scotland from the North Sea to try and catch fishermen who were fishing for a particular species west of Scotland, then sailing round to Peterhead and claiming that they had caught it in the, in the North Sea or doing it the other way round, claiming that it had been caught in the North Sea when it had actually been caught west of Scotland. So this is, this is simply by way of uh, telling you that relative stability, although it looks on the face of it as if it's not unreasonable and based on historic performance, and it's probably based on the best statistics that we have, actually the statistics that were used to inform st uh, relative stability were pretty ropey uh, and uh, subject to quite a lot of quirks. Um, this is just to show you um, in relation to those stocks that are particularly important to Scotland, uh, what the Brexit deal actually um, put in place in relation to major uh, demersal and trawled shellfish species uh, under the uh, trade and cooperation agreement uh, and, and the withdrawal arrangements. Um, you may have heard it suggested that um, fishermen got 25% more by value of the um, species that they were interested in, but I defy anyone to calculate that moving over five years from 52.97% of the catch to 57% of the catch is, uh, uh, is anything approaching 25%. The 25% figures that you've probably heard uh, are um, much more common uh, in, in the context of the Southern North Sea and the English Channel. Um, so over the next five years, the amount of North Sea cod that our UK fishermen are allowed to catch will move from 52.97% on relative stability uh, of the total allowable catch to 57% of the total allowable catch. Similarly, relatively small increases uh, and no increase at all in North Sea nephrops um, 
which sits in the middle of the North Sea and where um, the UK, and that means uh, principally Scottish fishermen, have uh, the lion's share of the quota. Um, I talked briefly earlier about the transfer of fishing rights and the fact that uh, you could um, swap um, uh, fish uh, between, uh, between different uh, fishermen. Uh, and that has been achieved uh, through the licensing process, which I talked about earlier, um, where each vessel had a license and attached to that license would be a certain quantity, a percentage of quota. Uh, and fishermen were able to transfer their licenses from one vessel to another or to buy a license from another fisherman. And when those licenses were transferred, the quota share associated with it would transfer with the license. Um, I referred earlier to taking some of the uh, vessels out of operation, decommissioning. Uh, and originally that would be paid for by the public sector. But what happened partway through the uh, decommissioning processes were, was that arrangements were put in place to enable fishermen to decommission their vessels uh, and dispose of their quota rights to other fishermen. So to sell on their quota rights, thereby reducing the cost to the taxpayer of um, putting big holes in uh, fishing vessels and sending them for scrap. Um, and finally, there are things called quota swaps, uh, which are uh, generally not operated uh, within individual countries, but can operate between countries and between EU member states. Uh, the way the system is working at the moment, I'm not entirely sure, um, but uh, uh, until we left uh, the European Union, there would be a whole series of negotiations between um, different member states, um, uh, which would be along the lines of, um, I don't need as much um, uh, cod in the North Sea, and I know you've got a right to take hake out of the west of Scotland, so can I swap some uh, North Sea cod for some west, west of Scotland hake? And, and there were the, a whole series of international uh, quota swaps that were undertaken on this basis. Um, because, uh, and, and similar arrangements with Norway as well. Um, but none of these swaps can actually take place until you've all agreed on a total allowable catch. And to my knowledge, in 2021, no quota swaps have yet taken place between any of the. Uh, uh, states uh, fishing in the in the North Sea, but I may be mistaken on that front, uh, since I may not be up to date. If anyone has any questions about transfer of fishing rights, I shall try and answer them. Um, there are a whole series of issues in relation to access and, and, and which waters one may have access to. Um, there are three zones, generally speaking, not to six miles, six to 12 miles and beyond 12 miles. Um, within 12 miles of the Scottish coast is the territorial sea. So out to 12 miles, the waters are part of Scotland. Beyond 12 miles, they're not part of Scotland but they are within the economic zone that surrounds Scotland and the UK. And that arises from 
the various stages in uh, the law of the sea, which involved uh, the extension of fisheries limits to 200 miles. Again, those of you who are longer in the tooth will recall the Cod Wars with Iceland when Iceland extended its fisheries limits to 200 miles from the Icelandic coast and told British fishermen that they couldn't fish in that 200 mile zone for cod uh, around the Icelandic coast. Until that point, uh, the fisheries limits were 12 miles uh, or six miles as the case may be. Um, and historically, around the UK coast, there are historic rights that French and Belgian fishermen have, for example, or Irish fishermen, to fish in the six to 12 mile zone, um, uh, based on previous conventions uh, related to fishing rights. Um, Nought to six miles is with uh, very limited uh, exceptions, an exclusive zone for um, national fishermen. So within not six miles, uh, it's basically exclusive waters for um, local fishermen. Uh, in the six to 12 mile zone, there are limited rights based on historic performance and beyond 12 miles, it's all based on the, the TACs and the quotas and who may or may not, uh, who may or may, may not fish. Um, I haven't talked about zonal attachment, um, which is a different way of dealing with relative stability. Um, but again, I didn't want to complicate things too much at this point, but if anyone wants to know about zonal attachment and what our fishermen are after, after 2026, I can attempt to answer those questions. But what you will have seen, undoubtedly, is um, the UK government sending gunboats to Jersey, um, where French fishermen are fishing in the zero to six or six to 12 mile zone based on historic agreements with, uh, with Jersey. Um, and uh, the, uh, the issues there uh, are uh, relatively fraught, um, but uh, I would just point out uh, uh, that um, don't forget that Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, and the Isle of Man are crown dependencies uh, and uh, are not part of the UK. And these are not UK waters. Um, uh, indeed, um, I can recall bust ups uh, with the Manx when Scottish scallop fishermen were expelled from the zone around the Isle of Man as a result of Isle of Man waters being subject to particular conservation measures. So just, just bear in mind those sort of slight complications about the Irish Sea where the zone around the Isle of Man is not part of UK waters and around the Channel Islands which fall into a similar set of circumstances. Um, final couple of slides on catching fish. Um, this is uh, the em Scottish employment uh, in the uh, fishing industry. Uh, about 4,000 fishermen, about 900 part-time on top of that, and 40 crofters, 0.2% uh, 
of uh, Scottish employment. And that is not the landings by Scottish vessels into the ports around Scotland. It is the landings into the ports around Scotland by all vessels, wherever they may have come from. So that will include landings by Spanish vessels into the west coast of Scotland, for example, if there have been any uh, that were marketed at that at, at that point. That's just to give you a, an approximation for where the important ports are, and you will see that Peterhead and Fraserborough uh, and Shetland are the major fish landing ports in Scotland. Um, the, let me remind you that the yellow is demersal fish and the blue is pelagic fish. The blue pelagic fish is exclusively Peterhead, Fraserburgh and Shetland. There's no pelagic anywhere else. Um, you'll see uh, a split between demersal and shellfish uh, around the west coast and then further down uh, the west coast, quite a lot of shellfish caught between in the minches between the Western Isles and the mainland of Scotland and the um, all of the shellfish ports you can you can see uh, and that that applies to the Firth of Forth around Edinburgh as well. And that finally is a sort of snapshot of the statistics in 2019, which I won't go over in uh, any detail, but I will leave up on screen uh, for just uh, a few seconds to allow you to have a look at that. And then hopefully I will manage to stop sharing the screen and see who might or might not be asking questions. <laughs> so, quite a lot of information there. Um, I hope I haven't confused things too much. Uh, and uh, I welcome any comments, questions, or anything that anyone else would like to raise or would like to know. See if I can see any hands. I can I can see a physical hand from John Hume Robertson. I think you're muted, is that, John. Is that me? I'm muted. Uh, yeah. Well, th thank you, David. That, 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 that's been me re-educated. I, I was very briefly the Scottish Fisheries Minister. I, I don't think our paths crossed directly on that one, but that that, that was good re-education. Re uh, very familiar stuff. Um, what I wasn't familiar with is where we are after Brexit. Uh, key points, as they've always been, we, we, we've got very vulnerable fish stocks, um, which need to be looked after, otherwise otherwise they'll, they'll be wiped out. Um, we've got a pretty efficient fleet man, manned by what you describe as hunter-gatherers, and I'm not going to dissent from you. And there's a tendency to think that all the people who are breaking the rules are foreigners, uh, I learned during my brief career uh, that Scots, um, yes, they, they take a few liberties as well. Indeed. In, in my day, there was a Scottish presence at the European Fisheries Council, uh, and I saw a bit of how some of these things are, are worked out and agreed, um, and, we, and we, ha we had a presence at it. Uh, for goodness sake, these fish swim around all over the North Sea and round about the coast. They need to be managed internationally we need to have some kind of collaborative system for looking after these fisheries. And incidentally, our people need to be able to market their fish. You haven't touched on that one. Um, the fact that we can't sell all the fish that we're allowing. Um, yeah. We, 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 we need- That's part uh, access. two. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so 
we need to reinvent the common fisheries policy. It is a fully devolved subject. Um, I wonder whether it would be possible for the for the for the Scottish government to try to reopen negotiations and dealings directly with our European partners, or is this all going to be left to Boris? Uh, I am sure that my former colleagues in the Scottish government uh, will be uh, involved intensively in all of the negotiations. I don't think. Uh, that uh, the UK government will be attempting to uh, exclude Scottish officials uh, from the negotiations over what about ministers? Uh, TACs or quotas. Um, ministers after devolution did go to yeah. fisheries councils. I um, did. So uh, there is no... There is no particular, I, I haven't asked the question, uh, but uh, it would be perfectly normal for a Scottish fisheries minister to uh, accompany a UK fisheries minister uh, to uh, any ministerial level uh, negotiations. Now, how the, the, the tensions always arose over the extent to which it was appropriate at EU fisheries councils for the Scottish minister to speak for the United Kingdom on a particular issue. And uh, that was, uh, I mean, it, it, it won't surprise you if I say that that was a, a source of some tension, um, particularly with governments of different hues uh, north and south of the, of the border. But there was in practice a recognition that when it came to certain uh, fish stocks that uh, the uh, Scottish government would effectively be in the lead and would be offering the scientific assessment and leading on the question as to how uh, how things should be managed. And uh, it's also true to say that even after devolution, uh, Scottish officials, uh, and to an extent Scottish ministers, but mainly at official level, were involved very heavily in negotiations with Norway or Faroes or Iceland, as the case may be. So from a, from a, from a practical perspective, uh, if you can get away from the politics, uh, uh, I think that the uh, that there will be a recognition that, that both Scottish government ministers and their officials need to be very, very closely involved uh, in the uh, in, in in the exercise, as historically they have been. Whether whether they whether they would stretch so far as to allow Scottish um, officials to chair um, uh, working groups or or things of that nature, I'm, these days I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, when prior to devolution, uh, it, it was relatively straightforward for the Scottish office to lead on a particular uh, nexus of issues, but. Uh, after devolution, there was a bit more, a bit more tension about the, the respective roles of the UK government and the Scottish government. But cooperation with the with with the member states of the EU, uh, absolutely, uh, and and with Norway and bilateral. Uh, I, I would imagine that bilateral contacts will be being reinforced. But it all has to be done through Whitehall. Um, with Whitehall, I would say. <laughs> yes, Mr. <no>, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact the fact is that that the, the the fishing industry around England, with one or two notable exceptions, is relatively small in com in comparative terms. Uh, there are uh, exceptions to that, particularly in relation to. Um, vessels fishing out of Grimsby or vessels fishing uh, nominally out of Wales, although there are quite a lot of uh, either um, Spanish 
vessels or Dutch vessels that theoretically fly the UK flag. But, you know, the, the fundamental point, um, uh, and I, I, I see that you've got a wonderful Bellany on your, on your wall there, um, is that uh, in practical terms, uh, the uh, folk uh, in Whitehall recognize that the expertise uh, and the uh, contacts uh, are, lie with the um, with Marine Scotland rather than rather than with Whitehall when it comes to dealing with the northern part of UK waters. I bet I better pass on to somebody else. <laughs> I could go on. I could go on for a long time, and I must. Yeah, I'm. I'm afraid I could as well. But since we're being recorded, perhaps I shouldn't say anything further. So, who do I see? Uh, Ian Scobby, it's a hand up. Yep, I'm. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm professor of international law at the University of Manchester. Uh huh. I direct the Manchester International Law Centre. I think that you might want to talk to one of my former students. I'm very proud of him. He is a professor now himself at the University of Lincoln. He's called Richard Barnes. He is a specialist in fisheries. Mm -hmm. Talk to him. You know, I, I'm here tonight because my my good friend Elspeth Atwell, who was a former MEP, told me about this, and I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, Richard annoys me because I set up a. I, 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 doctoral program for him in Glasgow when I was teaching in Glasgow. And then we bugger went off and went to Hull. But he <laughs> is a guy of fisheries. He's still a good friend despite that. Okay, thanks, and, thanks very much for that. Have you got a comment or a question? No, I'm just telling you about Richard. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks very much. He knows all about fisheries. Mm -hmm. From the international so, law point of view. Understood. I'm sure he's more expert than I am on the subject. I'm a bit rusty. He's bloody more expert than I am. Mm. I'm looking to see whether there are any further questions or whether I should carry on with the um, talking about processing. Anyone else want to ask a question? Please shout because I can't see any hands up. David, David. Give, me, give me a second. Jo John, John's had his hand up for ages, David. John, John, sorry. Um, I'm afraid trying to operate the screen and see people is, uh, yeah. is, is a bit difficult. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask David about the Norwegian, the failure of the Norwegian relationship, apparently, last week or two. Is that very critical for Scottish fishermen? And is it going to make a big difference to our, and uh, what is our relationship with Norway direct between Scotland and there? And what, what's going to happen with, with that? Well, as, as I was saying to John Hume Robertson, before um, there is there is involvement of uh, Scottish government officials uh, in the negotiations with Norway. Um, the issue, as I understand, the the, the latest problem uh, uh, was to do with one of these international swaps that involved uh, allowing a three month fishery, January, February, March, for a particular vessel fishing out of um, Grimsby um, that was reliant on that fishery um, north in North Norway. And it was 
it is, if you will, the failure of the EU, UK and Norway to agree on total allowable catches for the stocks that, that are of interest that, uh, that meant that the various um, side arrangements were unable to be completed. And it is now too late this year to uh, <coughs> assist the particular vessel uh, that was reliant on that fishery uh, in North Norway. That's as much as I, that's as much as I know about it. In general terms, uh, arrangements and, and relations with uh, Norway are pretty good. Um, and, but there are arguments uh, about the extent to which uh, a stock should or should not be conserved. And whilst those arguments continue, um, it's difficult to get all of the side arrangements in, in, in place because you don't know what the total is that you're allowed to take. So is it, is it important to Scotland that it's failed or does it not matter really? It, it uh, that, that doesn't matter too much. No, okay. No. I mean, it, 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 is, it is important to Scotland that um, the, Scotland, the, yeah. the issues uh, that uh, that the issue that the issues be resolved, um, and that the general negotiating atmosphere should not um, uh, should not be muddied. Uh, of more importance to Scotland is the fact that pharaohs uh, haven't agreed to the arrangements with the EU and Norway. Um, so pharaohs can be a problem, and has been a particular problem in the past, as far as Scottish pelagic fishermen are concerned. Thank you. Bill. Uh, thanks, David. The, uh, I've, I've got some really, you know, primary one questions here, just to display my complete ignorance of the subject. Uh, the, the, uh, the, you, you said that uh, pelagic fish are migratory, I hope I've got okay. that right way around. Does That's that right. mean that does that mean the demersal fish are not migratory? Do they not travel big they, distances? They they swim around, but they don't migrate between different areas. So you, a, a there'll there'll be movement around, let us say, the the North Sea, um, as fish go to spawn. Let us say they may go to certain areas of the North Sea in order to spawn, but they will not migrate in the way that uh, uh, Western mackerel does, for example, which goes all the way from between Norway and Scotland in the North Sea, round the Faroes, Iceland, back down to off Ireland, and then turns round and comes all the way back, following... Okay following the food source okay and, and uh, in the context of mackerel um, the important thing with oily fish is to catch them when they are fat and oily rather than when they are thin and starving okay makes and, sense and that uh, that process is seasonal and it means that the fish are in different international waters at different points in time when it makes more or less sense to catch them. Okay. And Thanks. when international, sorry, I'm just, just gonna point out that when international negotiations break down, as they did about 10 years ago over mackerel and might yet do again, with, with what is happening at Faroes, what tends to happen is that the different countries make unilateral declarations of their total allowable catches. And when you put them all together, you end up for two or three years taking vastly more out of the sea than the stock can stand. And you may be taking it, uh, taking the, the, the fish out 
at a point where it is much less economic uh, in the grand scheme of things. But if, if Iceland wants to pull the blanket in its direction, uh, at, even if Scottish fishermen were able to make more money out of the same mackerel, uh, it's very diff difficult in an international system to uh, negotiate in a way that enables the spoils to be divided sensibly. Yeah, thanks, thanks, David. I, I, I mean, I, I've got another primary one question that it's, uh, it's simply that lobsters and crabs, and I don't want to take up a lot of time because I can see that Vanessa's got her hand up as well. Uh, lobsters and crabs, uh, is it only creels that are used for catching lobsters and crabs? Is that, that, that exclusively creels? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so when we talk about creelers, that's what they're, they're, they're that's what they're referring to. Uh, it, it, environmental regulation gets a mention every now and then, especially in the west coast. I think it might be Loch Sween where there was there was a protected area. Uh, it, it, it does our removal from from the EU does that potentially impact on the environmental regulation of local areas? Uh, it can do. Yes, um, and that uh, what, what I should say is that there is often a conflict between static gear, that is creels, and mobile gear, that is trawls, when it comes to fishing for shellfish, um, or where different uh, fishing activities go on. So um, there are some famous cases in which um, uh, static fishermen um, uh, rolled uh, broken down cars off cliffs in order to stop trawlermen from trawling areas where they wanted to put pots. So putting obstacles in the seabed to foul the gear of um, uh, mobile gear fishermen. So there are intra-industry issues there that are related to uh, mobile gear and static gear. But more generally, um, it has always been straightforward in relation to inshore areas and um, uh, uh, and, and, and shellfish and particular types of fishery. It's always been easy for the UK and the Scottish governments to um, uh, regulate the fishery without, without any interference from the EU at all. Um, although there's an overarching environmental uh, set of environmental regulations. If, if, the, if the Scottish government wished to ban um, uh, trawling for, um, for scallops with dredges, uh, it could do so. But given the economics, it, it, that's not necessarily a step that it would take. So I don't, I don't think that, uh, to, to answer your question in a different way, I don't think that our exiting the EU has restored powers to do things uh, to any great extent that, that Scotland didn't have in the past. Right, thanks, David. I'll, I'll, I've taken up enough of your time. I'll hand over to others. I gather that Vanessa, from what you say, is wanting to say something. Unfortunately, I only have... Uh, Thank you, yes. The ...participants on the sign. <laughs> that's, that's kind. Thank you very much, David. It's it's been a fascinating tutorial so far. So thank you very much indeed for, for sharing all your knowledge with us. Um, like yourself, I've been rewilded out of uh, Scottish government service, but I, I, I never served in, in fisheries matters. So it's been absolutely fascinating, but probably rather too late. <laughs> Should have done this 30 years ago. Anyway, um, my question is... Um, 
were Scottish, were UK fishermen actually that badly served by the common fisheries policy? My recollection from my last years in Scottish government is that we talked up quite a lot about um, the fact that Scottish fishermen were doing quite well. They had uh, some degree of influence over regional management, cod con conservation policies, for example, and were, you know, doing doing pretty well. Uh, is is that the case, or um, do do they really have a grievance which they hoped Brexit would solve? I don't think it has. And sort of related to that. If Scotland became independent, should it rejoin the common fisheries policy? Okay, short answer, the common fisheries policy had its faults, but those are faults associated with fisheries management generally and the conservation of the stock. And actually, I don't think as a general proposition, uh, Scottish fishermen did badly uh, out, of the, uh, out of the process. Indeed, in more recent years, Scottish fishermen were actually at the forefront of best conservation practice. Uh, they trialled the use of CCTV on fishing vessels so that the statistical problems that I've just described could be overcome and that the, the, the fishing activity could actually be monitored. Um, and so uh, the Scottish industry has actually been at the forefront of good conservation practice. Uh, now, the, the problems with the common fisheries policy, I think, derive largely from the division of stocks and re under relative stability and the requirement to discard. Um, now, the CFP has been developed, uh, discarding is now being discouraged or stopped. Uh, and the argument that the fishermen had was that the relative stability key that dates from the early 1980s uh, did them down, that they didn't get a big enough share out of that his relative stability based on historic rights and that they would get a better share based on an alternative mechanism known as zonal attachment which is a scientific assessment for how much time the fish spend in your waters rather than someone else's waters um, and there are some glaring anomalies in uh relative stability, uh, which have never been con corrected, in my view, because correcting them amongst 27 member states, even if all of those member states are not fisheries member states, is actually quite a difficult negotiating process. Um, but there is no reason in particular why Scotland rejoining the common fisheries policy should not have a negotiating position in relation to the relative stability key, which would be basically saying, we are going to be re-adding to the common uh, waters this amount of, of water, and that's the vast bulk of the water around Scotland where the fish are caught, um, and up on the border with Norway, which is where a lot of the uh, fish are caught. We're, we're bringing this water to the party and our future uh, relative stability should be based on an assessment of how much time the fish spend in our waters and what the economic opportunity is for EU fishermen if they want to fish on the border between Scotland and Norway. So I, I, I think it could be done. And, and the CFP in its own right, I mean, uh, is, it, 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 it is not the issue. It's, it's, the, it's the difficulty of managing fisheries in a multilateral environment that is the, that is the real 
uh, problem. Unless anyone um, wants to jump in, I'm going to move on because I'm conscious of the bear, time. Bear in, bear in mind the benefit of access to the European market, which is very valuable. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I'm about to oh, right. <laughs> So I will carry on if I can, again, manage the technology. Uh, So, a few words about fish processing. Um, as I say, the UK processes seafood types. Um, a lot of the, whoops, sorry. A lot of the seafood processing for, for frozen fish purposes happens in the Grimsby Hull area. Um, but shellfish processing happens all around the UK uh, and all around the coast of, uh, of Scotland. And most of the, the fish production facilities are, are relatively small. Um, and finally, almost all of the salmon and uh, mackerel and herring processing happens in Scotland, uh, which is where the fish, uh, where, where the fish is landed. Um, these are the figures for employment in fish processing, uh, just subdivided by different parts of Scotland. As you can see, the number of um, employees uh, very much focused on Grampian, North East, Fraserborough and Peterborough and uh, Peterhead. Um, uh, and then after that, Highlands and Islands, which of course includes Shetland. Um, and if you've remembered the figures that I gave you for the number of fishermen, the number of employees in fish processing uh, is uh, significantly greater than uh, the number of fishermen uh, employed in, in catching uh, fish at sea. Uh, the UK totals are given in the final row uh, for, uh, for comparison. So, I thought you might be interested to know around 60% of the Scottish processing workforce are EU nationals. At least they were until 2021. Um, whether that will continue to be the case uh, remains to be seen. Conversely, uh, the, uh, the people employed in the processing workforce in England and Wales, and that's predominantly, as I said, Hull and Grimsby, uh, have a, a, a relatively lower proportion of EU nationals. So traditionally, the, the health of the processing sector uh, in Scotland has been very significantly dependent on employing um, uh, migrant or immigrant labour from the rest of the European Union. Um, that um, shows you where the uh, workforce comes from or came from. Uh, as you can see, a very high proportion from Eastern Europe, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, uh, relatively fewer from, from elsewhere. Again, that's just an, an illustration for those that are interested. All right. Um, this is uh, able to give you a, a comparison of fishing, that is the catching sector, uh, aquaculture, fish farming, mainly salmon, uh, and seafood processing, and the relative importance uh, in terms of uh, gross value added. 
and you can see there that the gross value added of, of seafood processing is significantly higher than the gross value added uh, of the actual fishing activity. Uh, but even when you put all of those together, uh, the proportion, sorry, the proportion of the uh, Scottish economy accounted for by the fisheries sector is pretty small. And uh, most commentators would suggest that politically the fisheries sector uh, carries much more weight than it actually contributes to the economy of Scotland. That's not me trying to get the fisheries industry it's just representation of the of the economic statistics. Um, this is this is a, a, a picture drawn from uh, quite a, a good analysis that the Scottish Parliament's uh, information services put together. If anyone's interested in seeing that, uh, I'd recommend going online to the Scottish Parliament and drawing down some of the spice. Um, uh, products. And I just wanted to give you there um, what uh, the proposition was as far as the aquaculture sector was concerned. Uh, marine fin, fin fish is, is salmon farming for salmon and trout and shellfish is the mussels growing them on ropes and, and oysters uh, and this uh, is how uh, in 2012 people were hoping to expand the level of production uh, from uh, aquaculture uh, to the year 2020. I'm afraid I wasn't in the time that I had available able to find the precise figures uh, that had been achieved for aquaculture by the year 2020, but I think I can say uh, that those targets were both ambitious and have not been not been achieved. Um, that's that's actually all that I wanted to say about fish processing and aquaculture in economic terms, uh, but uh, we can have a, a discussion about the reasons why um, exporting to the uh, EU markets uh, from Scotland uh, has been pretty badly affected by Brexit, um, both in terms of the value of landings of whitefish into the northeast of Scotland and in the ability of um, Scottish seafood um, shellfish um, processors uh, to export live product to the markets in France and uh, Spain. Um, I should say that we haven't had, to the same extent as England, uh, difficulties in the exportation of bivalves um, because the waters, particularly around the west of Scotland, tend to be relatively clean and therefore from an environmental perspective uh, you can actually put mussels from the west of Scotland on the market or scallops on, on the market without having to put them through a process of purification which you need to do if you're catching them in the channel because the channel has much dirtier water than we find in the west of Scotland. That's again a gross generalisation but uh, but that's the position as far as exporting um, exporting bivalves is concerned. But if anyone, I'd I'd rather ask um, attempt to answer any questions that folk might have around the issues that have struck the the sector since Brexit, 
uh, uh, rather than rub it on uh, at any greater length. So over to you folks. Again, I can't see the hands going up, so I'll invite you to um, shout um, uh, if you'd like to ask a question. David, yeah. it's Bill. Uh, David, uh, I was struck by how much smaller the aquaculture sector was in your diagram than the the uh, the, the main fishing sector. Sector mm. is, is that is that is that well presumably is well, the case. It, 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 it surprises me given the the prominence that uh, fish farming has. Well, it's actually different species. Um, you know, you know, for aquaculture, you're talking about salmon and trout, yeah. effectively. Um, you're not talking very much about other species, although there is a certain amount of, of farming of um, halibut, for example, that goes on. The, the main problem with, with whitefish is you can't farm them because they eat each other. <laughs> cod, cod are the top predators. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you try and raise cod in sea cages, they will eat each other unless you keep them very precisely at the same size. So it's just not really a feasible proposition to farm cod uh, in the same way as you can farm salmon that are very nice to each other and don't eat, e eat each other. There are a couple of questions in the chat box, uh, David. Uh, I don't know okay, if... Uh, yeah, I can I try and have a look. Um, one from Yulia and one from Don. I can, I can read the back. Yeah, when, when I talk about seafood processing, I'm talking about all fish products and all seafood products. Um, anything... Uh, that you do to a fish to process it, uh, as opposed to simply putting some ice on it and sending it to the continent. Um, so if you're smoking, if you're smoking a herring, you're processing it. How likely is the, is Scottish f fishing to benefit from Brexit, and what is the quid pro quo? Well, um. Uh, over the period uh, to uh, 2020, um, Scottish fishermen will be able to catch an increasing proportion of some of the fish stocks. So there will be, uh, provided that the stock is not, the relevant stock is not overfished, and that the TAC is not reduced dramatically, there will be a gain from what there would have been under the relative stability key. I've shown you, I, 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 I showed you, I think, the, um, the example in the North Sea, which, uh, you know, a few percentage points of an increase in share, um, but a few percentage points of increase in share uh, are of no value if the cake gets smaller. Yes. So the important thing is that the total allowable catch should be sensibly set by the various parties that are involved in setting it. And that means the EU, the UK, Norway, and depending on the stock, Faroes, Iceland, uh, and uh, uh, yeah. That's, that's about it. What's the quid pro quo? I'm not sure um, what, that, what that means. I don't know whether Dawn is still there. Yes, Dawn, Dawn's still there. I don't know if Dawn wants to... Dawn, do, you want, do you want to speak, Dawn? What is lost, she's asking. What's lost as a result of Brexit? Um, well... Um, what is what is lost uh, potentially 
is the uh, ability to have certainty about who can fish where and for what. Um, but in, in overall terms, uh, there is um, no economic loss uh, from, uh, from, from the Brexit uh, arrangements, but there may be um, uh, the, the losses that occur tend to occur from the loss of market access rather than the inability to catch the product. And it's the, you can, let, let's put it this way. You may be able to catch a bit more cod in the Northern North Sea, but if when you sell it at Peterhead, you only get half the price, it's not gonna do you much good. And it is the fact that market prices have dropped in Scottish ports for whitefish as a result of the inability to get it to the continental markets that is the real downer. That's the, that's the downside from, from Brexit. Um, so it's the inability to put your product into market that is the real killer associated with Brexit. I hope that answers the question. I think, I think John, John Hume Robertson has a question. Yeah, John. Uh, what do you have touched on is enforcement, um, which is a, a difficult one. And, and in my time, there was a quite a significant problem with Scots landing what was called blackfish, black uh, which is fish, which is, oh, you know, people who caught much more than their quota, uh, they, they landed it under the radar and it wasn't enforced. Uh, and of course, th th this applies to other fleets as well. Uh, well, yep. while you're in the European Union, there's quite good uh, cooperation and, uh, going on on that. And, and, and other countries were in, for if, if people were catching fish they shouldn't have been catching in British waters and they tried to land it back home, something was done about it. Uh, we're going to lose a lot of that cooperation, I would have thought. I, th uh, I think there are potential risks associated with, with the loss of cooperation, uh, but I would expect uh, the UK and uh, the uh, and Marine Scotland uh, to continue to cooperate on on the policing front, not least with the Norwegians, uh, as they have done uh, as they've done hitherto. And actually, we're in a better we're in a better position than we were in relation to demersal blackfish, um, because um, increasingly we've got uh, GPS monitoring, uh, transponders and CCTV uh, that actually, um, you know, the fishermen uh, rail against, but uh, are broadly speaking compliant with. Um, we've had serious problems in the past with um, the pelagic fisheries uh, and undeclared landings of pelagic fish associated with um, the illegal burial of pipelines in uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that are used to pipe the fish uh, onto land. Uh, but again, although I haven't had any conversations of late uh, with people responsible for fishing uh, policing, uh, I think that uh, blackfish is less of an issue uh, than uh, it was, uh, John, in, in, in your day. Uh, and I hope that that remains the, remains the case because if people are uh, infringing the rules uh, and, and, and not, abiding with the, uh, not abiding by the um, scientific advice and, and therefore the amount of fish that's killed at sea, uh, everyone is the poorer for it. So it's a, it's a shame that uh, we are, we find ourselves in the position that we do, uh, but uh, I think that from an enforcement perspective, there is still likely to be close cooperation 
uh, between the uh, between Marine Scotland and the other fisheries protection uh, arrangements. Yeah. Oh, so, any more for any more, or shall we wind it up? I'm sorry, I've got to go. I quite understand. Don't be sorry. Did I hope it's been helpful. No, no, I mean, yeah. David, David, fish. Yeah. Great. David, that's that's been uh, that's been marvelous. I think we do need to wrap it up there. Uh, the, the, we, I think uh, the, we, we, we've gone well past our time. I think uh, we've done done extremely well. Uh, the the the, the, uh, the 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 will Caitlin, if she's not already done it, will put a a, a feedback link in in the in the chat box and or and we'll try to contact you by email uh just to, to get feedback from from everybody but i think uh i'm, I'm sure you'll all want to thank me for, for what's been a fantastic uh, performance from david it, you know, it, 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 obviously we could spend several sessions on this uh it's been really quite interesting uh, how, you know how, how, how much you, know, you you think you're getting your hand, arms around something you just realize there's a whole new area to explore uh so thank you very much for that david uh, and thank you to everybody for for coming along and participating uh, especially and uh, very much I look forward to to your feedback and good night and thanks and again david if there are any further questions that strike people after the event, they should feel free to uh, uh, email uh, Euromove Scotland. I'm sure those emails can be passed on to me, if there are any. Well, I'm sure if there's Thanks any so that say fishing them, you'll get them, David. Okay, Doug. Thank, Thank you. you a lot. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.